let's get started. So um, I'll call the meeting to order. And the first thing, um, Michael, please correct me with terminology. Um, just wanna get the minutes from last time. Um, has everyone got a chance to receive them? Shelby and, and Lisa? Yeah. They look good. I'd like to take a vote if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, all in favor for submitting the minutes into the record, say aye. 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 All right. So I'll get those over to the clerk. Um, so first thing today, um, I think we'll have uh, Patrick and Ken start um, and talk about the report Ken um, made. Um, and then I see Chucky, Chucky's here. So then we'll, we'll go and, and have him kind of talk about the um, right to farm bylaw. Um, so um, Shelby, if it's all right, you still got minutes as secretary. And I'll turn it over to Patrick and Ken. Uh, do, you wanna, um, do you want me to bring up your report? Yeah, if you could. Give me one second, I gotta find it. Hmm. I want you to start talking through it. We'll give me a minute to find it. I just want to call Okay. Everybody see that? Yep. Yep. So I think they've all read it, Ken. Why don't you just sort of talk through what you found and what your recommendations are? Okay. So I was given the task of uh, looking at the trees at Ice Glen for. Um, the presence of hemlock woolly adelgid and the elongated hemlock scale, and also looking at the, um, the ash trees, the white ash trees that had, um, they, there's significant ash in there. They're very large. They, um, they have quite a size. And um, I'm, I'm just, I'm wondering if everybody had a chance to go ahead and read the report. I can go through everything. Um, I did read it. Um, so anyways, I, I worked there um, for four or five days surveying the trees and um, looked at all the hemlocks that were 10 inches or greater within the glen. And, and most of them, I would say, if, if you look at the report, you'll see that about 60% of them are in poor condition. And that's a mixture of two invasive insects, hemlock woolly adelgid and elongated hemlock scale. And just to cut to the chase here, um, hemlock woolly adelgid, it's been around for a while in the state since the uh, mid 1980s, early 1980s, but been in the country since uh, the 50s. And, um, we've had it in the state for a while and it hasn't really caused considerable damage because we've kind of been on the leading edge in terms of, of cold. Super cold temperatures knock the population back and pretty much have kept it so that it hasn't caused tree mortality. It's there, it builds up, builds up very quickly. Um, the insects are all asexual, they're all females. Um, they reproduce, they have two reproduction stages. So they reproduce very, very quickly when they have the opportunity to. And they can cause a lot of damage. Hemlock woolly adelja can cause a lot of damage. We're, we're starting to see an, an increasing amount and starting to see a lot of mortality now from adelgid because our winters are getting warmer and the insect is building up quite a bit. So if you'd gone to the south of us into uh, mid and southern Connecticut, into Pennsylvania, into Delaware, 
uh, Washington, uh, Delaware Water Gap, you'll that's where you, you we saw a lot of tree mortality from hemlock adelgid. But now you're starting to see the signs of that slowly creeping north. Massachusetts, um, Race Mountain has a bit of um, tree mortality from adelgid. Mount Washington, um, Bashbush Falls area. So that insect is is actually just starting now to be a major problem in the state. And, and as I said, we are the, the leading edge of that mortality now where it was to the south of us before. And adding insult to injury, there's another invasive that has come along and that's called elongate hemlock scale. And that insect is just making um, the hemlocks even more susceptible to uh, decline in mortality. And if you see that picture there, that was a picture that I took of some of the branches and you can see uh, what's pointed out, the hemlock woolly delgin. The levels there are, are, are really high. Um, the elongated scale is at um, kind of a brownish elongate um, marking there on the needle. So the two of them are, are sucking the nutrients and the sap out of, of the needles. And eventually what ends up happening is the trees um, they, they get to a point where they can't sustain themselves and all these secondary pests come in, wood borers, bark beetles, uh, armillaria, uh, shoestring root rot, which is a, a decay fungi. And that is usually the nail in the coffin to finish the trees off. So you're at the point right now in Ice Glen where these trees without mitigation are not gonna tolerate much more of this. The, as I said, 60% of them are, are in really tough shape. And you see my ratings, I, I used a health rating of one, two, three, and this is kind of a simple rating used uh, by forth, forest health experts. Uh, when you have this type of a problem and you need to do some kind of mitigation, you need to figure out where, where your problem is and how bad it is. And this is just what we, I, I'm a, I go to a little bit of my, my history. I worked for the state of Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. I was the forest health program director for 10 years, the last 10 years before I retired in 2019. And we did a lot of this work where we knew, we knew this was happening, we knew it was coming, and we did a lot of mitigation work where we came in and started treating the trees because, you know, mostly in old growth forests. And, and we treated about 15 different areas with a pesticide called dinotefiron. And it's expensive pesticide, but it's the only thing that works against the elongated hemlock scale you um, pretty much have to treat both the adelgin and the elongated scale. Um, so we, we ended up treating, we, we had to put it out to bid. We, we, at the time, searched for federal money, but couldn't get any. Um, so we ended up getting state funding, um, which um, as part of my job, I had to you know go and, and advocate for that with the state. Um, so you know we did quite a few properties, as, as it's in the report there, Bashbish Falls, Tolland State Forest, um, Sanderson Brook Falls and Chester or some of the ones in the Brookshires, but we, we did other areas across the state and primarily looking at the same situation that you have in, um, you know, in Ice Glen where you have significant hemlock trees and, and old growth hemlock forests. So losing them would be, um, you know, it, it would be significant, not just to the forest, but aesthetically and, and um, and I'm sure you would get some public outcry if, if nothing was done. Are there any questions so far? I don't know if I'm going too fast or people, yeah, yeah. I, I, I had a few questions, Ken. First, thank you. It's an excellent report and uh, really well done. So I appreciate that. Um, I did have a few questions. I know you looked at everything above 10 inch DBH. So if, if the things that are below 10 inch DBH are not treated, what prevents the insects from moving back into the trees you did treat? Uh, that's that's a good question. Um, I, I they the the under ten inch tree did have a lot of delgin and a lot of elongated scale too. I I was mostly looking at preserving the the old growth hemlocks. Yeah. And and I'm not an expert at old growth, but Bob Leverett was with us in the initial walk. He he's the the old growth. They call him tree guru. He's the old growth expert for basically the whole country. Um, so he pointed out to me that a lot of the, the hemlocks in there had been measured and were old growth trees, some of them up to 400 years old. So that was to me significant. And that's what I was looking at. Um, and I was also thinking if you, if you're, and this is what we did with the state, 
we were thinking we had to think about cost. If we had to, you know, do the mitigation, if we had to treat, which were the trees we're going to treat? And if you were going after every single tree, like from the three, four inch diameter, 10 inch diameter tree, I mean, you're, you're looking at a major, major amount of money. So if a tree is treated, does it keep the, the pests off for a number of years? It's, it's basically good for two years. It reduces the amount of, and I'll just tell you how we looked at it. What, the overall goal and if you've looked, if you've read one of the pest alerts from the Forest Service, is to um, is is it's kind of a you're just trying to get these trees to stay alive until you get the biological control insects to become established. Okay. And there's a whole nother story behind this. I mean, when when I was working for the state, we tried releasing three different biocontrol insects. We did not have very good luck getting them established because the ones that they gave us just weren't acclimated to our climate. They're working on a, a new one now that is, um, it, it's, it says it in the bio, uh, in the pest alert there, it's from, it's from out west, out from Washington and British Columbia, and it's called Laracobius nigrinus, but it's, it's a certain strain of Laracobius nigrinus that is from that area, from the upper, um, upper west, upper northwest. We never got that strain. We always got Laracobius nigrinus that was reared down in It never got accustomed to our winters. Mm -hmm. So, it's trying to get that strain into Massachusetts. And, and just to be honest with you, every other state in New England and New York is fighting to get that. Mm -hmm. So, and the, the, you know, you have to get them, you have to go collect them. You have, it's a very expensive process and get them here and get them established. And this could take many, many years for that to happen, but that's the ultimate goal to, is to create that balance of where you have predator prey so that, um, so you don't have to treat, but that's just for indulging. Now, elongated hemlock scale, for some reason, the Forest Service just doesn't consider that as great a threat. And maybe it isn't as indulgent because it's not as widespread, but here in New England and New York, it's a big problem. And it's, it's trying to get the Forest Service to start looking big picture for us here. And that, that's, that gets more into politics and, and you know our legislators pushing for that with the U.S. Forest Service and the government, and it's it's a whole nother story. Uh, but just to be able to reduce the amount of adulgid and elongate hemlock scale right now will keep those trees alive. If you don't do something, uh, there's you just you're, you're going to lose those trees. You're definitely going to lose those trees. They they are that bad. And about, this is the same thing that happened, like as I said, on state properties, Mount Tom, Bashbridge Falls, Tallinn State Forest. We we got to the point where we knew we had to treat them. And mm -hmm. it was the same exact situation. Is there anything to learn from the one healthy hemlock? Um, Might it be resistant? I, I Well, I think it just didn't have that much adelgid in it. Was, it was kind of, it was away from the other. The, see, mostly adelgid is spread by birds and elongate hemlocks. It's birds and yep. birds like hemlocks. That's where they hang out. Um, and they're getting it on their feathers on their feet and they go from tree to tree. And I, I think that one that well, I know that one hemlock was um was, was away from all the others. It was by itself. And more than likely it was just that the birds didn't want to hang out there as much. Okay. It's, it definitely has a delta in it. I would be 99% sure it's in there. Yeah. It's just not as bad. So I have some questions as well. Um so the these hemlocks have both woolly adelgid and elongated hemlock scale on them. Yeah. Um, and, and the woolly adelgid can be dealt with with, that, with an injectable pesticide. What about the scale? The, okay. the, reason, why you would, the reason why you would use dinotephron is because it works against the scale and adelgid where in most cases, like to the south, where they've treated just for adelgid, they use imidacloprid, which is a lot cheaper. It's expensive, but it's a lot cheaper than dinotephron. Dinotephron is, is a, more than double the cost of imidacloprid. And, but it's the only thing, imidacloprid does not work against uh, elongate hemlock scale. And you have, to, you have to treat for both. You have to bring those populations down. And 
So we started treating five years ago and we haven't, and I'm just saying we, because I'm saying DCR in the state when I was there. And each year we came back and, and we monitored and we did not, we have not, at least up until the time I retired, had not seen a buildup from that. But you know, you do the initial treatment, it lasts in the tree for two years, but you continue to monitor and um, and you might not have to treat again for five years. It's, it's, you just have to break the cycle. You have to reduce the amount of inoculum that's in the trees and, and get it down so that those trees can survive. So so then we, we would need to recheck you know, basically check them periodically, and um, and if it looks like the treatment's basically worn off, then they can be retreated. You would you would have to monitor. You you would you would retreat um, if you saw that the levels got back up to to um, the point where they're actually going to cause tree mortality. So it's it's a it's not just treat once and you're done. It's it's you treat and then. You, you monitor, you have to go back in and, and check these trees and see that they recovered. So you would, basically what you're doing is you come back and you're looking at the foliage and you're seeing that the adult, you know, I, I, the adult will die, the elongated hemlock scale will die if you treat them, but you have to go back in a year and say, okay, you know, see what the levels are, see um, how, more than likely once, I, I know this material, it works very well. Once you treat, you're not gonna see adult or elongated scale for a good two years, and but you, you need to go back in and just constantly monitor, monitor, monitor. And it's an annual, we'll do it? Yeah, once a year, you just you, okay. you monitor. And best time would be like this time of year. Um, the most aggressive out of feeding is it's pretty much done from February, February to June. And this is where, like, if you go out there right now, you'll see that picture I showed you, that was right now. It's a lot of adult and a lot of scale. Um, I know. If, if I may, I have one question, Ken. Yeah. You keep saying treated. What um, method are you? Do you have in mind? Are you talking about an injection, a drench at the roots? Are you talking about tablets? No, nope, the best. On the bark? We, we sprayed on the bark. That was the most cost-effective treatment. Um, injection, you know, it, that's double the cost of basal bark spray. And you would only do injection, which we did do some, if you're within 50 feet of any any kind of water, you know, a stream or lake or anything like that, you can't do basal bark spray or ground treatments. You have to do injection. And the, the injections can be very expensive, even more expensive. So basal bark spray is the way to go. And that's uh, treating you know, backpack spray, you mix the pesticide, you just spray it right on the bark and it gets absorbed right through the bark. That's uh, from the from the ground up to five feet, you spray the bark and it gets absorbed right in through through the bark. So it's, it's you're spraying on the bark and you are, and the tree is absorbing it up. Um, with these trees, the old growth and the way that the Delgid is feeding uh, on the needles, uh, have you seen any resistance to the uptake higher up in the tree if they are destroying like the vascular system is it, it how long does it take to get up there if you spray it on so the reason why you you actually need to do it soon is you need to have the new growth so when the new growth elongates the new growth that actually helps to suck the pesticide they're, they're systemics they become part of the plant it's the same thing with injection it actually gets pushed up into the um in, you know, it helps suck the material up when the new growth comes out. And then once you hit the end of June, July, and August, it's too hot, it, the stuff just doesn't do it. doesn't suck it. So the best time to treat is pretty much right now into mid to late June. Then, um, I mean, this is all work that has been studied by the USDA APHIS, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, and also the Forest Service. And I, and I worked with them on these studies. Um, yeah, we, we worked, I, well, I worked with the um, U.S. Forest Service at Delaware Water Gap on the pesticide trials. So I know how this material works. I know how fast it gets up into the cannabis. And you're, you're probably looking at uh, three to six weeks for it to actually get up, up into the upper crowns. If the trees don't have enough food, and some of them, as I said, are, are in really poor condition, they, um, they might not take the material up because they just don't have enough food. So 
that is a determination. I mean, because I, I did this work and I, I, in a forest health expert, I knew which trees not to treat because I knew the ones that, that just, it wasn't worth it. They weren't gonna take the material up. And you have, I would, you know, a, a good 30 trees that probably will not take the material up, maybe more. They're that far gone. They're still alive, but they just don't have enough foliage to, to suck that material up into a canopy. Just when you when you do the spraying, do you um, post it? Are there any warnings that need to go out to people using the trail? Um, we we well, you don't have to, but we did. We put signs out. We put signs out saying, you know, we were spraying. Um, we just did it as a courtesy, but it's not a requirement by the um, Massachusetts Pesticide Board. But we we always did it very early in the morning. We tried to do it when people weren't around. Mm -hmm. You know, we were we were there at daybreak and and pretty much were done by ten o'clock. Um, I mean, based on the number of trees that you have there, depending on if you if you're having it done and you're hiring somebody, it's it's a probably a two day process, maybe three days. Mm -hmm. And um, you know yeah. you you have to put certain like if you're going to put this out you put it out as a contract. There's things you have to put into the contract what you want. You also have to put in there how you want because there's different levels of pesticide and how it's mixed. Mm -hmm. So you have to put that in there. There's all there's. I mean I could share a contract. I I'm, I could get a contract that the DCR put out and share that if you decide to go that way. There's just there, you have to be very specific with contractors. Um, and what you want. And I would just make another suggestion if you do decide that you, that you have somebody monitor what they're doing, because I, I can just tell you from my experience with contractors that you gotta make sure that they mix it right, that they apply it right, because this isn't something that people, come, you know, you're, you're gonna hire an agricultural firm and it isn't something that they do every day and you wanna make sure that it's done right because you're spending a lot of money on it. Do they need a license to apply it? They, is, this is a, um, Dinotepheron is a restricted use. So that's another thing. Yeah. You have to have somebody with restricted use license and only a restricted use license holder can purchase it and apply it. And unfortunately, I had a lot of companies that I worked with and I can get into the whole thing about hiring contractors. It's just a whole nother story. But, you know, we were on top of them because I was on the pesticide board for the state. And um, that, that was part of my job being on the pesticide board, making sure that people follow the law. So I, I ended up kicking a lot of contractors off. But, um, we did um, some of the treatments on state land. Thank you. How soon, you said that we should do it soon. What, what's the time frame when it's best to do the application? I would say now until mid-June, maybe end of June. It's a short window. I mean, you can, once it gets hot, it the trees just don't take it up because you, the stomata, stomata in the in the needles, the, um, the bark has to be rece uh, receptive to take the material in, and then it has to move. And in July and August, when it's hot, it just it doesn't move. It just it'll just sit there in the trunk, and you want it to get up into the canopy. So you're kind of in a time crunch right now. Um, it's either that or you wait till it gets cool again um, in September, or October, and and treat then. Which would be another season of damage. Then, right? They're, they, yeah, they're feeding now. They're feeding heavy right now. Yeah. This is the time when they feed heavy, and then they they uh, adulted anyways. Shuts down, gets warm. They they don't feed in July, August. You know when it starts getting hot, but September when things get cool again, it's a cold season insect. And elongated scale feeds all the time, but mm -hmm. it's it's you know you got to slow the process down. You got to break the cycle. Um, what was the other chemical you said that they had been using and that doesn't treat the elongated scale? It's a metacloprid. These, these are that... all uh, neonicotinoids. Yep. They're all the neonicotinoid family. Do, um, now, is it possible, how long is the protection for the, the dino, um, help me here with the, the dino form? Uh, Dinotepheron and Imidacloprid, yeah. it's, both are right around two years. Imidacloprid, you could probably get three years in the tree. So it's a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. okay. It's the same, same method, though. You 
you you treat you monitor and you might not have to go back you know for five years and treat again it's just you gotta you gotta you gotta monitor so how in your opinion how many trees do you envision are um or you'd recommend that actually i don't want to say deserve uh but actually could use a treatment and how many are too far gone to to actually be able a treatment would be useful for them so we well we we surveyed and right. took measurements on about 350 give or take hemlocks all on both sides of of the glen into you know and the steep areas we didn't go way way far back so you you could have um mm -hmm. You know, um, but I would say that your main main concern, and this is mostly because you invite people into the glen and they hike through there, is you definitely got to treat the ones that are that could fall into the glen, because once they die, they become a hazard. Mm -hmm. And and as long as you're inviting people in to the glen, you're not shutting it down. It's a liability. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, those should be the highest priorities, the ones that actually could fall into where people hike. And that, that's the same thing we did for DCR. We, we, no way possible we could treat every single hemlock. Right. So, so how, how many is, how many are roughly um, in that zone? I'd if you have a sense. 150. Yep, 150 that on both sides, if you're looking at both sides of the glen. So that's the number that should be treated there. I mean, What's the estimated cost difference between treating 150 with one treatment or the other? So Diditefron, I'll, I'll just tell you the last time I put it off the bid, and that was in 2019. And it came in at, um, I think it was $16 an inch DBH. And we put it off the bid. We got our, the bids ranged from six, this is for basal bark treatment, not injection, from $16 an inch up to $25 an inch. That was the range from three different companies. And this, these are three major arboricultural firms in, in Massachusetts. That's an inch in diameter? Yep, so a um, let's say a 10 inch tree at $16 an inch is $160. A 20 inch tree, 320. It's very yeah. expensive, yeah. very expensive. Dinutefron, I, I do this work and I just purchased some Dinutefron to do some of my own work for on properties. And I bought six pounds and it cost me $850 for six pounds of it. It's, it's very expensive material. And that's and my we, cost before I even go out and treat. And if we treat just for the adelgid, what's the cost per inch? It, you're probably looking in the 10 to $12, anywhere from, I, you know, maybe eight to 10 to 12. Uh, you know, metacloprids is not cheap either. So if I'm, if I'm correct, what you're coming to the, or what we're asking of the commission is whether to treat it all. And if we do treat, which one to treat with? Is that what we're deciding? I feel like it's um, right now getting this information and hearing our options and exploring all the options and whether to treat what to treat, how many to treat, um, and with what. So it's kind of all, all the questions um, the, right now. The, yeah, okay. so I, I don't see anything in, and I'm not sure I'm, I don't know how to spell it, the, 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 the other treatment that really only works on the adelgid. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mention the aminocloprid only because, you know, when I worked for the state, we didn't use it because it, it just, it, it doesn't work at all against elongated scale. And you really need to get rid of both. You really need to, because okay. they're enough. both just as bad. They're both doing just as much damage. So the ones, the, the, the roughly 150 hemlocks that, that we really should treat do you have any sense of like what the average diameter is? You know, just just so we can get a sense of like what's the um, keep. It's at the bottom of the report. If you look at the bottom of the report, um, it's 
you have all the numbers there and you go to the bottom of the page, the left, ah. bottom of the page, I think it was 24 inch average DBH, 23.1 yeah. was the average DBH. Mm. And the average health was 2.5. That means like most of your trees are in poor, poor condition. That, that's the, that includes the ash, but I mean, I, I would say, you know, you're definitely looking at trees 20 inches. Majority of them are, I mean, if you go through the list there and just count the ash trees because the ash trees are quite large. But so, the average hemlock is in the, in the say, 20 to 30 inch range. So basically, uh, you're talking about $400 a tree at 23.1 times 16, let's say is 230, you know, maybe $350 to $400 a tree. So, you know, 150 trees might cost. 50 to 60 grand. Mm -hmm. so the last contract we put out, we spent $68,000. And that was at Sanderson Brook Falls in Chester. How many did you treat? Um, I think we did 200 trees. We, that was like one of our bigger projects because it, if you've ever been there, it's hemlocks on a gorgeous waterfall and people hang out under them. And it was, it's exactly like the Glen, very steep with hemlocks and on steep slopes. What kind of equipment are, if they are spraying, what kind of equipment are they using? Is this, is this a crew coming in with backpack sprayers? Do you yep. have to haul tanks up there? No, just- Are there heavy equipment? No heavy equipment, just backpack sprayers. So, I mean, I mean, I, if, if you were asking me if I was gonna do it, I would want to have access to go up that property off Ice Glen Road as far up as I could to the trailhead with a pickup with a water tank on it. Mm. And then park, you'd park right there and then you would, you would ferry water in on backpacks. That would, that would be the most ideal way. You wouldn't want to come in off Park Street because that, I think that's the other way in Park Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's much for yeah. yeah, you have to go a ways before you get to the Glen if you come off Park Street. Yeah, and then most of the hemlocks are on the Ice Glen Road side that need to be treated. So I, I just want to throw a couple, I, I don't want to take up all the time in your meeting. I just want to put a couple more things out there that you should probably be aware of. So I, again, I work for the, as a Forest Health Program Director for the state, and I had connections with the Forest Service. And I did get in contact with the um, head entomologist who works out of um, Wisconsin now uh, about, you know, they offer, uh, they call it um, suppression funding. And it's too late to apply for it now. You have to apply the previous October. And at the time I tried to get suppression funding for years and years and years and just never was successful. But now the person who's in that position is from Massachusetts, actually went to school, did all his graduate work at UMass. And you know, I have a, I have a, and have had a connection with him, and I told him what was going on. Um, in you know, you can wait till next year to do some of the trees. I, I would definitely suggest that, but you know, take care of the ones that are right along the gorge right now. But the rest of them you could do with with suppression funding from the Forest Service. And this is money that you don't have to cost share. You don't have you know you don't have to match it. Usually, money from the Forest Service is 50-50. You put fifty percent, they give you fifty percent. This is all money that is available, but you have to, you know, have somebody write up the grants, uh, submit it to the Forest Service. And because, you know, this is a historical area with old growth trees, it, it, it's definitely something that the Forest Service would probably fund. And that yeah. would be for next year, Ken? Next year, yep. Next year. Okay. But it would be next year, it'd be a year from now, but you have to have somebody in October or before October, you have everything ready to submit that grant. I think it's due October 1st. And does your report cover most of the information we would need for that? Or would yep. That be yep, that's how I wrote the report up so that it, it has everything in there that you would need. And and I I, I could help you. And actually the person who took over for me, Nicole Kelleher is her name. She's the director. It, it would have to go through her. You know, okay. The state forest health program director is the one that has to submit it to the forest service. All right, so if that would be your connection and the town should definitely look into that. And I, and I can help you with that. I can make, you know, help you make those connections. So if we approve this, if this gets approved by the town, I'd be happy to work on that uh, suppression. Yeah. 
And it, what does that actually cover? Is there anything, what can we put into that grant in terms of suppression? Well, what, you know, say you treat now this spring, mm -hmm. it would just show good faith and the Forest Service would be looking for that. Okay, you know, this is a historic area, it's got old growth. I mean, it, it's got everything that they would be looking for. And you've already, say you put money out and you're gonna treat the spring, then you ask, because you need to do basically that whole area. You don't want to lose those hemlocks. You put in for suppression funding. You know, you could probably get fifty, sixty thousand dollars next year, if you know if you have already done some work this year. You know, they're looking to save as many hemlocks as they can. Um, yeah. In fact, when I talked to him, he's very surprised that um, because it, as soon as you say old growth, that's what they're trying to save. Old growth hemlock is who's the can. Can you say who the person is? Um, I'm just curious. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. If you don't remember, that's okay. If you don't want to, that's okay. He's he's the director of forest entomology for the U.S. Forest Service out of the. Um, okay. Uh, it's out of Wisconsin now. The office moved it. It was in, in down in Pennsylvania, Newtown Square, but they just moved it out to Wisconsin. Okay. Thanks. So is this a federal grant program or a state? I should, federal I grant. Federal grant. Ah, okay. Suppression and, funding. Yep. Uh, Real quickly through the white ashes and what a recommendation there is. So with the white ash, the the ones that I looked at, they, you know, what I was looking at because they don't have leaves on them yet. It's basically is is woodpeckers going after emerald ash borer larvae. And it's called blonding, and I didn't see any evidence of that. But right around the corner from there. Uh, in Stockbridge, you have you have a lot of emerald ash borer, you know, already killing ash trees. So, and the ash trees there are are significant. They're very large, and I believe you have like some that are 130 feet tall, 44 inch diameter. That's you know, these are some of the largest ash ash trees that I've seen in the state. So, it, eventually, you will get emerald ash borer. There's no stopping it. It is going to kill ash trees. There's, there's, the only control is a is an injection with emmetrum benzoate. Um, so I put that into the report. If you um, want to save those ash trees, you got to treat them. And EAB is, um, it's there. It's in Stockbridge. It's all, it's in, it's all over the, it's in Lee, it's in Lenox, in Richmond, it's Pittsfield, it's everywhere. And I'm sure you've seen all the ash trees dying. If you're, if you've cruised around the Berkshires, you can, you can see signs of it where you see the, the woodpeckers pulling the bark off the trees and just drive up Route 7, you'll see it all, all in Lenox going up Route 7, going into Pittsfield. Mm -hmm. So even though we're not seeing, you're not seeing sign that there is an infestation at this point, do we treat preventively or do we just wait and keep monitoring and then it, treat what? I would, I would say it's in there. It's just, it hasn't gotten to the point where the woodpeckers are starting to go after larvae. The level isn't that high. But it's right around the corner. It's there. It's it's yeah. it's on High Highland Farm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's treat though now. Yeah, I mean, the the material that you use to treat, if you treat it now, is good for three years. And the same, it's the same exact thing. The state is working on releasing the biocontrol insects. They've released them um, all over the place, and that. There's three different ones they've released and those they've actually been successful in getting them established. But it just takes a long time to get the biocontrols established. And in the meantime, ash trees die. Those ash trees, because they're significant, uh, you, you might want to treat them. And, and that is expensive too. It's, um, we, we had contractors treat some of our ash trees and some of the significant ones in our parks and that is right around the 12 to 15 dollars an inch um, emmenectrin benzoate. There are other pesticides that people are using and this is just another thing that when I worked for the state, I, 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 I worked on these projects with the Forest Service and with the USDA APHIS because they, um, they, they hired me because I'm a tree climber, I, they hired me to climb up into the canopies of the tree and take down branch samples so that they could test whether or not the pesticide made it up into the canopies. But I was with them when they did all the pesticide trials. So I got to see firsthand what worked and what didn't work. There's a neem product out there called azadractin that there, people are, you know, because people are worried about what pesticides do to the bee population right now. But azadractin is basically useless. 
it, it acts as a prophylactic, but it doesn't, if EAB is there in the tree, it does not kill EAB. Hmm. It, it doesn't, it, you have to treat, um, it's just as expected, ex expensive as Mvectin and Benzoate, but it only lasts one year. And um, imidacloprid does not work against m one ash borer injected into the tree. This, this doesn't have the efficacy. Is there suppression funding for ash treatment also? Or just there, they just started um, offering suppression funding for ash treatments. They didn't for many, many years, but last year they just started uh, doing that. Okay. And is it um, one, one grant per species or? Yep. Yep. You can't mix. Uh, you can't do different species. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And there are very, far fewer ash trees to to mm -hmm. deal with, right? I think there were uh, some. I think there were thirty-eight. It's in the report that I that exact. It's in the thirties in there. And then yeah, those four. Yeah, I didn't measure. I didn't measure the smaller ones. I mean, you had some that were eight okay. to ten inches, but I mean, you had six or seven that were 40 inches or more in diameter that's that's very big for for a white ash tree they and they're very tall mm -hmm. bob leverett could probably tell you better um about the significance of those ash trees because he he measured them all and they're some of the bigger biggest ones in the state yeah and maybe in new england too yeah he pointed out that they they get once they get this old and this big, the bark actually changes and it yep. looks different from what you ever expect an ash tree to look like. Yeah. People don't, there are very few chances for people to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those are, the, I have to admit, they are the largest ash trees I've seen in my whole career in the Ice Glen. I've never seen an ash tree as tall and as big. I've seen some big around, but not as tall as, as the ones that are in there. Yeah, so the average diameter for the ash trees actually may be higher than the average than that total average that you had for all the trees yeah, it's, together. Yeah, it's I would say it's in the 30s average yeah. for the ash trees that are in there. I mean, I should have separated. I didn't separate it. I I put but everything together do, and yeah. It would be handy since I mean you must have this in a spreadsheet. Could you just break out the hemlocks from the ash trees and give it to us as a as a as a just so we have that to work with? Yeah, yep, I can do That'd that. That'd be great. Yep. Um, I have a question. If we move forward with this, would you be available to monitor the contractors? Yeah. Because we don't have anybody who can do that. Yep. Okay. I mean, I can help you set up putting a contract out if you want. and. Helping you, um, I mean, I know all the contractors because I am a contractor. I know, I know them all, most of them, <laughs> the ones that would bid on it. Um, I'm just looking at the time. I want to make sure everyone's got their questions. And is there anything else, Ken, you want to finish up with? Um, I guess I'm up all set unless there's any questions from you. I, um, everything right. should be in the report. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for putting it together. Um, yeah. If it's all right with everyone, um, I want to see if if we can um, continue this deliberation onto a uh, the next meeting. Well, yes, Lisa. What's the timeline in terms of making a recommendation to the select board? I thought Good that's a meeting, a special meeting tonight because there was some pressure to make a recommendation. Yeah, what, what is the next, what are the schedule for the, the, the select board meetings? Remember that the, the town can't approve the funding until June 12th. So obviously we should try to power Jackson in a row so that if we do get some funding approved, we're ready to act. Um, you know, I, but I will leave it up to you guys and Michael to figure out what that looks like. Yeah, and I wasn't sure, Patrick, if you were looking for this committee to support the article. Because um, we do have a $30,000 article for, treat, for treatment and assessment. And Yeah, I am mean, I, I, um, all ears. Basically, I don't have any agenda. I just, obviously, I see the problem and the urgency. 
So, so there is an article already written. There is an article, but we uh, for treatment, but we haven't necessarily chosen what necessarily chosen a treatment path. This was what we were waiting for mm -hmm. with this report was to lay out um, exactly what we'd be doing. Well, it was mm -hmm. brought up about using this chemical before. Um, it was something to have the report done and then actually have the document in front of us. Mm -hmm. So at some point we'll have the article pass and then a treatment method is gonna have to be approved. Mm -hmm. uh, that's and right cool. now, the recommendation from the report that we have is that we treat that chemical. So do, do we, as far as town meeting at Warren um, and all that, do we need to be as specific as what treatment route we want to take or do we just need to? Oh, okay. So, so we don't need have to, to be specific to the treatment method yet, but shortly after um, town meeting, we'd be looking to so depending on the timeline, um, kind of the town meetings June 12th, funds become available July 1st to contract. Um, is that too late for a treatment in the spring? So we'd be looking at a fall treatment? Yeah, I, I, July is probably getting too hot. All right. Well, that's, yeah, that is one thing I worry about uh, doing this right with the, it, the turnaround time and like Ken's saying, if we can't get it when it, the trees are growing and uptaking this, it's really tight. And then I don't know what that means for that article and continuing on to the next year, if that's possible. Well, it, it, the article's good from July 1st through June 30th. June 30th. So, um, and then you can extend um, free articles for free cash can be extended beyond that. So if the next cycle is October, that would be a treatment, I heard, in the late fall. Up September, you could treat. September? Yeah. Yep. So we so, could, we could, once the article passed, if we determine that this is the treatment method we want to go with, you know, if you're going to go out to bid, bidding is at least six to eight weeks. So even if you're looking at July, you would want to have, you'd want to start in July to get the contractors lined up and the rest for September. I mean, it sounds like it's far away, but it, it really, it's really not. Um, like I said, it's a six to eight week process to get everything through. So probably by July, we'd want to know what method we're going with, because if we're going to do this in the fall, I would want to work with Ken, if that was a way to put it together and be ready for this fall. There's only one method. We're either free or we don't free. According to our expert, we're treating with Johnny Tuckeron or we're going to let him die, right? I mean, I, I think that that's kind of what it comes down to, right? Well, I, I also want to propose a third option here is that we are able to uh, consider our options and make sure that we aren't um, putting $30,000 out there um, and putting a treatment and then we're going to have to redo it every two years. Um, I want to make sure that we are we have time to deliberate. And I know tonight we have a lot on the agenda. So I just want to make sure that if the, if any of the other members want to propose voting on it tonight, that is an option. Or if we want to take uh, another night, another meeting before June 12th. I think the report, excuse me. I think the yeah. report is pretty, uh, pretty extensive. There's only one chemical you're going to treat with. Um, and I just leave the ash trees and see if we can get a grant for uh, next year. And thirty thousand dollars doesn't do much. I mean, if if we're up at seventy thousand plus to do the hundred and fifty trees, mm -hmm. we probably ought to go for that money if we're going to do it and do it right. And 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 it might be only $50,000 um, once we pull apart the average, you know, the, the, the tree um, diameters of the hemlocks versus uh, versus the ash, but um, but it's still more than $30,000. So I, you know, when thinking about the timing, it seems like we ought to go for this warrant. Um, and if, you know, if, um, if Mike and the select board are comfortable increasing the number, 
great. Um, you know, we can do the math and figure out what do we really need to do a full treatment. Um, and if they're not, then we prioritize. Um, and we do the treatment in September. At the same time, we prepare the proposal for suppression funds for next year. Uh, so by next year, we will presumably be funded to do treatment on both species. Um, so, uh, or, or at least next year we do, we go for the, for, for the, ash, the ash treatment and say we don't need another treatment of hemlocks yet uh, unless we have not been able to complete all the hemlocks this year, in which case, yeah, we go for a suppression grant to finish the job on the hemlocks. It doesn't sound like we, they can complete all the hemlocks this year. Yeah, I mean, not, not unless they increase the budget. Yeah. So, so then it sounds, then maybe what we do is we say, we treat, we treat the ones that are at, you know, the most critical this year. We go for two suppression grants and next year, next year, hopefully in the spring, we get that money and we treat both species and then we monitor. And then as needed, we, we apply for a new suppression grant whenever it looks like we need to do a new treatment. Okay. So I, I'm thinking, I, I feel like I have enough information to make a decision on whether or not to support the article. So um, can I make a motion? Before you make the motion, yeah. $30,000 doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. So we've got to, if you want to do 150 trees, mm -hmm. uh, the rough is 70 grand. And you don't know what the bid's going to come in at. So the, the amount of money has to be increased to, to, to be anywhere near effective. What is the process for that? Yeah, Mike, Patrick, wait, what's the deal? Chuck, I think Chuck's here. Yeah. We have um, to, the warrant hasn't been finalized. So if the select board did uh, vote to increase the dollar amount that is within their authority as we haven't closed the warrant yet. Why don't you figure out how much it is to do all the hemlocks? Get a get a you know a little more of a concrete number and maybe do the hemlocks this year, put the ash trees on next year, then the following year be the hemlocks. So it's kind of a rotating basis. And in between those times, you know, go after the grants and all the uh, stuff that's out there. Sound like a plan or the yeah. Okay. How, how do you get a more concrete number than the diameter average? Yeah, I mean um, sorry on the 70, but uh you gotta give us that number so I and writing at a meeting so we can discuss it. Yeah, so what we did with the state, because we were in the same boat, we had to find the money and have to get it approved, is we actually put it out the bid. I don't know if, if communities can do that different than the state. Um, we didn't, you know, we would put a clause in there that we didn't have to go with what was bid, but we would put it out to bid just so we knew what we were looking at for funding. And then we went after the funding. Uh, I don't uh, think you, you can do that. We don't have... Yeah, yeah I'm not even, I wasn't even bid, aware of the state. You have to have the money approved. Yes, the state. I guess has different rules because you know we we put it out the bid and no I don't know. Well, you might have put it out the bid with a clause to be able to pull it back because we yeah. can always do that too. Is put it out the bid then reject all the bids. Yeah. Um, but, or you just contact the company and ask them for their estimate, of course. Yeah. Um, to try to get an idea um, of what it would cost. So, can I don't know if you could give us a rough price and then we could put a contingency of say ten percent on top of it and use that as a baseline number or are you not comfortable with i i just know what was bid last time and and the, we paid 15 dollars. that was the last bid we got and that was, at, go, sir. that was uh 2019 in the spring okay, good. and that was at in chester at sanderson brook falls and prior to that it was 12 dollars when we did um mount tom um Hemlock Gorge. We did a whole bunch the year prior. We had a lot of money. I got a lot of money out of the legislature the year prior, 2018. That, does that include the application or just the chemical? 
No, that's everything. Everything. Okay. Yeah, they charge you by the inch. So, you know, I, we, you know, I had a small staff. I had to go out with them as they're spraying, measure the DBH prior to them spraying. Then you, and you also have to make sure that they mix it correctly. So you're right there on top of them, watching them mix it because they will short you if you're not there with them and make sure they mix it correctly, go out with them. You mark the tree when it's done, make sure they do it correctly, make sure they put enough on. Um, and the last time it was $15 an inch, but the prices went up as high as 24. So it was a range. And there's three contractors. I, I can tell you the contractors, there's Mayor Tree Service from Eastern Mass, Northern Tree Service, and Bartlett Tree Service. And yeah, we well, put let's it out. Uh, can, let's not let's not get into the the, the, the nitty gritty right now because yeah, okay. it's almost. I, six I would make an argument that if we use the low bid and use at least an escal escalator, at least four to five percent annually, so we're looking at at least ten percent higher. Um, you know, fifteen something if we round round off sixteen, ten percent dollars, sixty more. We're probably looking at seventeen, seventeen, eighteen dollars a tree at at best, best case scenario probably. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I love an it. inch. Yeah. And you can, you can, if you could give us the, that table actually as a spreadsheet, then we can mess around with it ourselves too. And, okay. and there's one there's one hemlock that has a DBH of 215, which I suspect is a, a typo. Yeah, it must um, be. So, um, but in any case, if you can do that, then, then we can, you know, we, we can do the average, we can do the total, uh, and then we can do our math. Okay. So what I recommend so we don't get in trouble when you got two select board members here is to uh leave the rest of the meeting and let us leave and you guys discuss on what money you want to do and present to the select board that we're there to be no conflict. That uh, sounds like uh I've got another meeting that yeah. I so I'm gonna get off and you guys can keep talking. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. and Chuck, you're the official liaison from the board. So, yeah, but yeah, I don't want to have you no know, two members and right. you know, push for yeah. money and stuff that we can discuss this at a regular cycles meeting and uh, do it right in the front. Right. So okay. if we get the total, right, if we get that spreadsheet to figure out the total diameter, then we can figure out the exact, well, an estimated cost. Uh, even if we were to just use a number like $20 per inch. Just put enough money in it, so. Yeah. It's a very important project. And I don't foresee any big hassle in funding this at the town vote. All right. Now, I do have a finance committee meeting Wednesday, so I will give them the heads up that that article may be changing. Um, so, well, twenty dollars, twenty cube, twenty inches in um, diameter. 150 trees is sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, so just make sure you get enough. That's all I'm going to suggest. No, I, I agree with okay. you. Okay, it's, it's easier to have money back than it is to go after more. Right. All right. Wow. So if it's sixty thousand, and we're going to put in a ten to twenty percent contingency to build on that, um, you know, you're looking at roughly, let's say seventy two. So would be the high end. 66 would be the low. So if we go for 70, it should put us in a good position to be able to treat those. Yeah, and, we, and we'll check the numbers to make sure that, that that, you know, the 20 inch, it really is it. You know, we may be higher, we'll see. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> if we wait a week or two weeks, it's not gonna make the warrant, is that correct? We're probably gonna be, we're either gonna be closing the warrant this Thursday or the twenty seventh at the absolute latest. So, yes, we're in the we're in the end game right now. Well, I'd like to make a motion that we recommend seventy thousand dollars to the select board. Second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 I don't think you can aye though, Shelby. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. that's right. I'm not voting. <laughs> I can't my, vote either. My, I can vote on next time. Should, yeah, this time. We, Jeff is with you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so, so just for the minutes, uh, I, I I need to get uh, who again said it made the motion and who seconded it. I uh, Eric made the motion. 
I at least a second it. Okay. And just for the record, when you're voting on Zoom, you got to state your name. Mm -hmm. Right, Mike? Yes. Yes. This so it's up a no, board, you're, but... you're, you're, Yes, they recommend that you do in case there's any. Um, when it's unanimous, it's easy. If it wasn't yeah. unanimous, I would definitely make sure so you clearly know who did and who didn't. We forget about it too. So it's kind of, <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say we forget <laughs> about it a lot. Yeah. So uh, just to be clear, Michael, on the process of this in terms of this rec recommendation, um, what do we need to submit? to, if any, the finance, you? No, Chuck Shirley, I would just say Chuck will report on Thursday Okay. Um, that, you know, as we go to finalize the warrant, that there's a recommendation from the Forestry for, <clears throat> Forest Agricultural Commission that we proceed with treatment of the trees. But in order to do that, based on the report, we're looking at a $70,000 okay. appropriation. At that time, the select board will have to vote to alter that number for town meeting, and then we can go from there. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Your job is done. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. So let's, um, I'm wary of our time. So ben, thank, you. thank you guys. Um, I get thanks, off? Pat. Is that okay? Thank is it right for I get off now? Yeah. yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chuck, if you want to go ahead and fill us in about the right to farm bylaw. Well, that's a very hard one to write up because we had to go through the whole bylaw and just change the name of the town to Stockbridge. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a basic bylaw. Every town around us has it. Um, the basics of it is to protect the farmer and the uh, neighbors. Um, so I believe if there is a farm and the neighbor selling the house, the realtor has to state that there's a farm. Um, it protects both parties if there's any disagreement. Um, protects the farmer, I guess, against, you know, if somebody really rich moves in and keeps giving them a hard time taking the court and kind of forces them out. Um, you really can't do that, I believe. So it's a basic bylaw that every, pretty much every county, in, uh, Virginia County has it, every town. And what, um, in terms of, of our Part in this in terms of uh, what do you see us mostly handling and dealing? Uh, basically, if you just you know, endorse it, it's all you really have to do. Okay. Is there any complaints that will come our way? Or I don't believe so. Yes, actually there is. Basic bylaw. Was <laughs> that, Mike? Yes, there is. Is <laughs> there? Yes. I haven't heard it. <laughs> if you have a forestry commission, yeah. <laughs> agricultural commission. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so I, I thought I read something about that. <laughs> yes, let me share. Uh, so you can see here, uh, section five, resolution of disputes. Only a community that have our agricultural commission that any person that seeks a complaint about an operation or form may with notwithstanding pursuing other remedies file a grievance with the select board, zoning official, board of health, depending on the nature of the grievance. But if you have an agricultural commission, that's the ones that end up here in the grievance instead of the- So the it's you guys, grievance. it's us, so, which I think it's good. Yeah. Uh, Cause you got any other remedies, zoning or select board may forward a copy of a grievance to the agricultural commissions or its agent. Um, facilitate the resolution of the grievance and recommendation. So, yeah. And the Board of Health would still, uh, could, would inform you guys of any grievance that they have. So there's just a small piece, the small piece here that can be referred to you guys to basically be um, involved in a grievance. So, and today I did have a complaint. <laughs> so, uh -oh. yes. Beef, my uh, uh, beef cattle at Namkeg, I guess one mm. of them got loose. Well, that happens. <laughs> one of them came to Austin Riggs today and there was a big posse rounding them all up. Yep. <laughs> I heard that it All right, so there was more than bed. one. So you have more detail. But that could end up being neighbors complaining about that. Um, you know, if it's a one time thing or if it becomes a regular thing, that could be somebody, something that could be complained. 
to the select board and then the select board and then would refer it to the agricultural commission. So. Riggs isn't going to complain. It was the highlight of the morning. To uh, <laughs> uh, there, there was a resident that did complain about a half. <laughs> yeah, uh, animals do escape. Yeah. And those those cows are so cool over there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks nice. It's yeah. part of stock. Yeah. yeah. And that's about all I got on that. I mean, it's just, all right. Where are, uh, are you looking for a motion on this? Uh, no, it's already on the... Uh, or, but um, if you okay. want to endorse it, I think you can make a motion to endorse it and it'll be read into the, when we read it on the uh, town meeting. Make I make a motion. a motion to endorse the right to farm. Go ahead. I, I second. <laughs> and all in favor say aye. 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 All right, does anyone have any other questions about it, about the bylaw? We good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chuck. Well, you're welcome. And uh, finally, we are to uh, Shelby. Um, Shelby, you want to talk about the grants you were um, interested in? Sure, and I just doesn't need to take a lot of time. Um, the Last year, uh, the um, Laurel Hill Association applied for state uh, uh, for grants from the state. There's a state program um, that um, pays for forest stewardship plans of forested lands, uh, for our properties that are, I believe, it's over ten acres or something. Um, and uh, I wrote the the, uh, the the applications. It's really simple. Um, Jess Toro told me about this and recommended it. And um, basically what it is, is, you know, you find, I mean, I did six of them um, and I got them all funded. They, 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 they reimburse up to a certain point um, and it's unlikely, well, it's, if, if the forester who you hire ends up charging more than, you know, than, than the landowner ends up paying the difference. Uh, I think that there were a few, um, properties where well Hill Association ended up paying something like an extra thousand bucks or maybe it's a thousand dollars total. Um, it hasn't I my my term ended before they were all done so I, I haven't seen all the all the reports. But there's a um, a forester um, in um, in Alford who we used who just recommended um, and at the time I was hoping frankly that we could get the town to to apply for for grants on like the Iceland property and the town land that is contiguous with the Westdale Preserve, the old um, Loveless property, just because they're contiguous. And so, you know, it just would be efficient, but uh, we just couldn't work it out, you know, the timing and the process and everything. Um, the, it's, a, it's a rolling grant program where I think they have a certain amount of money each year. And um, as people apply, they give it out. And when they run, if, if they run out, you know, then, you basically have to wait for next year. So uh, we did ours about this time-ish, I think maybe in June. Um, and it's it's a real simple process. Uh, and I just, I think it would be really great if we could look at the town properties that are, that are forested um, and say, you know, which of these really would be worth having a, a stewardship plan for. Um, it's it's not just about um, you know lo lo um, logging. I mean, it's about whatever basically whatever your goals are for the property. The forester will give you a plan to meet those goals. And obviously, for Lowell Hill Association, it's the same as for the town. It's just you know we want to keep it healthy and um, resilient for, to climate change. And you know for certain properties, um, you know amenable to to uh, public use. Uh, in some cases, we just want to maintain the diversity. Uh, in some places, you know, the, the forester can find that you know there's invasive species that, that have crept in, and it's good to know because you want to get rid of them. Um, so anyway, I just that's basically it. The, I, I sent um, Matt, you know, some documents and links to the website, uh, and it just seems like it's a an easy, you know, no investment on our part except a little bit of time. 
I think that's the uh, website. If you guys are looking for those documents, they're all on the website too. So I have yep. a couple comments. Um, one, I'd be happy to help with that too, Shelby. I think it's a great idea to try to get some of those. Um, originally, when I saw it on the agenda, I thought you were thinking of it for Ice Glen. I don't know if you were. And oh, um, definitely for Ice Glen, but and for others as well. I had concerns about Ice Glen just because, and I and I would want more input on this, but um, a lot of the best management practices for old growth are just to leave them alone and not not do any active management, and just because nature does a much better job than we do. Um, so I would I would be cautious with a forest management plan for Ice Glen, not not necessarily opposed, but cautious and really want to see it. And um, I would like to be involved in the process because I also have concerns about invasive management and the chemicals and um, you know, how the invasives are used. So in general, I really support it, but um, I would want the commission to really see the details of what we're asking for and to approve it and not um, so that people know what's going on and have input. Well, it, it, these are important points. And um, one of the things that, that we, the, like the first step, um, once you get the grant and you line up your forester is to go over your, your goals and restri restrictions and requirements. So, you know, if we say, um, you know, we're interested in invasive management, um, but we don't want to use these practices or those practices or whatever it might be. Um, the, the plan is basically a, recommend, you know, a set of recommendations. You know, they, they, they draw, in fact, I think, I doubt that it's, um, well, I, I could ask Laurel Hill Association if they allow me to share one of the reports with you uh, that we got. I'm um, familiar with them, I've seen them, so I have not, oh, okay. them, but I'm, I'm familiar with the, with the, uh, with the process. Yeah, and, and it, the, one of the things that's, you know, it's, I mean, of course, it's, it doesn't, we don't have to do what, what the forester recommends. Um, but one of the things that's nice about it is that once, it, once we have a stewardship plan, we can then apply for other grants that are only available if you have a plan. Yeah. So we can then apply for things that will help us to do some of the things that we'd like to do on these properties. I mean, in your experience, Shelby, if, um, if say we were to a property like Ice Glen, hearing Lisa and saying like, you know, it's an old growth property coming up with a, a stewardship plan and incorporating, looking for the woolly adelgid in the future, like we've been talking about and making sure that we're on top of it. Is this something that it's, is it purely forestry, like as in um, calling trees versus like, can we actually set up a plan for managing it and like observing the invasive species? So we don't, we know when we have to retreat in the future. Is that possible? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's it's not it's not forestry it's okay. it's forest stewardship mm -hmm. okay. so whatever our goals are if we say we don't ever want anybody to cut a goddamn tree out of here so don't tell us to do it okay and he won't um it's really it's i mean it's interesting because uh when you when you read the stuff on the on the, this the state website they make it clear that this is if your goals are long-term ecological health or recreation or whatever um you just basically say to the forester this is what our goals are and we you know we're not interested in logging we just like logging is out is off the table and so mm -hmm. the plan will reflect our priorities and our and our goals mm -hmm. yeah okay any other questions or any I, other yeah just one more comment and kind of in conjunction with this um, Bob Leverett, who Ken mentioned, and I are the Berkshire County coordinators for the Old Growth Network. And I think the Old Growth Network had approached the town, I don't know, I'm new to town, so I don't know how long ago it was, um, asking for Ice Glen to be part of the Old Growth Network and the town declined. Um, I, I, I'd like to talk about that at the next meeting, at our next meeting and make a case for um, Ice Glen being part of the old growth network. I think it would provide 
Um, there's no cost. It would provide added protection. And um, if I understand correctly, and I don't know if any of the um, people here remember why the town declined, but I think it was not wanting added visibility for Ice Glen. Um, yeah, I, I was, um, the Ogle Forest Network approached me first and then, and then I, I said, you know, we don't own it. So we have to guess, basically go to the town and we, we wrote a letter of support. We got, I think the CONCOM may have also um, written a letter of support. I think the, I'm not sure who else, but um, I did a presentation to the select board and Terry Flynn basically said, we don't want more people to come to it. You know, it's so publicized. It's in so many guidebooks. It's on so many websites. And the old growth network is this tiny group of dedicated old growth advocates. I, I don't, I don't think it's going to add to. Well, why don't we, why don't we put, um, I will, I made a note, um, Lisa, if you send me an email with material and then I will, I will, we'll get it out for the next meeting. I'll put it on the next agenda. Um, any other questions for Shelby? Then uh, Michael, in terms of, of grants, and recommendations and what we can do in terms of, would we recommend that the, if we were to vote on something like this tonight, um, so go to the town or Chucky, go to town saying we want to support going for one of these grants? Sorry, you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll forget that. Um, due to, yes. But, you guys would make a recommendation to the select board to pursue a grant. And then um, your recommendation and Chuck can bring it as your liaison to the select board and recommend that we go after you know, a particular grant. And then, then we would proceed from there where if the select board said yes, then myself staff would work with the commission to go after that grant. Hmm. Okay. Correct, yeah. All right, then uh, I would like to make a motion that we um, support this um, effort to go for a grant. Um, I second. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Eric, aye. So if Chuck, Chuck will, you'll, um, I'll make sure that you um, have the material. Um, yes, send I don't, it on I don't to Mike, think... and Mike will get it to me. Send it to Mike. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go through Mike. Uh, We've already set the agenda for the next meeting, so that would yeah, be the, the twenty seventh that we were yeah. placing this on for. All right. So I'll send uh, the information to Mike. Uh, all right. I think that's all we had on the agenda. Thank you. I have you. a process question yeah. for Mike. Uh, sure. um, urban forestry came up in the discussion. Alicia mentioned it. And I sent you the, I didn't know whether I was supposed to send it to you, Mike, but there's a seminar, one hour seminar this Thursday, UMass, mm -hmm. on urban forestry. Yeah, I, I get those. Okay. Right. Yeah, thank you. Are Could I send it to the chairman? Is there any charge on that or is it a... No, that's free. Yeah, then we can... Yeah, whoever would like to attend then could... Yeah, they're free for, through UMass and you can join the list and they, they're, they're like almost every week and a lot of them are pretty good. So I guess what, what's your question, Eric, as far as attending or... No, no, no. Or... Uh, in terms of distributing to the other members, I didn't feel comfortable sending it to them. Um, so I sent it to you and asked you to forward it. Should I have sent it to uh, Matt? Oh, I must, um, I- That's okay. I didn't, sorry. Um, no, you, you could, you could, um, yeah, as long as you don't express an opinion or something, training materials and other stuff are exempt from as far as being a violation, but you can't deliberate on it. So you just say, here's an opportunity, please do not reply. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Yeah, same thing with scheduling the meeting, anything, as long as you don't get into a debate of, oh, is this really something we should do or should, now you're debating, don't do that. 
but if you're just going to send it out for informational purpose, just send it and say, just, you know, FYI. <laughs> and okay. You're That's good. fine. Yep. And, and if I understood you correctly, Mike, as far as, because this came up with the stuff I sent about as far as two issues, we can't, we can't send it saying, I recommend that we go. We cannot, just, just, right. No. no opinion, no yeah. plus minus, no nothing. Just, uh, just informational only. And FYI, every so often I'll send something to the board that just FYI, here's something that happened. Please do not reply. <laughs> and that, um, so yeah, I, I would say that you're safe. You can send minutes, you can send informational things, but you do not get into deliberation or recommendation or opinion on them at all. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up, Eric, because it is a good series. If that was an opinion. Oh, but I <laughs> oh, we're in the meeting. You can, you can, raise it here. You can opinionate all you want in the meeting. <laughs> all right. Didn't make it. Okay. If the, if that's if that is it, thank you, Eric. Um, then um, I just want to make sure we schedule our next meeting if we are going to get on our um, our first Monday of every month schedule here. If we don't have anything, uh, any other pressing matters um i think we we did the stuff that was coming up most relevant um so i got the first uh monday of june is june 7th is that okay still okay with everyone yes oh, i've got june 5th no i think it's the seventh monday the seventh yeah Oh, you said Monday, but Monday, yeah. And oh, Tuesday. oh, I was in July. Sorry, <laughs> to July. That's not good. No wish the summer were yet. Just heard it. That's six thirty, Matt. Six thirty. If that's still good with everyone. All right, and if anyone's got anything, please send it my way, and I'll make sure that it gets on to uh, the agenda. Um, and Mike, when are, when will the, or should I say, I say Chuck, when will the uh, warrants appear? What dates were you saying? Or this week, Thursday? The if, first if we, both of you said in this Thursday, right, Mike? Yeah, um, I have it on the agenda for this Thursday. If we can pull everything together, if not, it'll be definitely the 27th at the absolute latest. Okay. As far as the agenda items. Uh, okay. And that, that's why that was big to have this discussion right now is because yeah. that, that's the one piece we're running out of time on. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. If there's nothing else, um, I will motion? make a motion to close the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This is a uh, great committee. Thanks, Chuck. Let's be a part of it. Thanks. And all in favor say aye. Hi. Hi. Right, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> you did great. Thank you. It's Good night. Good night. See you all Good later. Everyone. Good night.